My father grew up a child of some privilege in Borough Park. He was actually born in 15th and 49th and raised there, went to Yeshiva Eitz Chaim on 13th Avenue. His bar mitzvah in 1925, uh, for his bar mitzvah, he received a total of about a thousand dollars, which in 1925 was a lot of money. His father purchased 160 dunam in Rehovah at the same time he purchased 10 dunam immediately adjacent with his bar mitzvah money. They believed in Eretz Yisrael, they invested in Eretz Yisrael. When he got older, when he was 17, he wanted to go to the Mir in Poland to learn. And his mother convinced him that that's a dangerous place to be because there are pogroms in, program in, in Poland. But if he goes to Hebron, the British, who were the mandatory rulers of Palestine at the time, my mother, the grandmother was certain that they would protect the Jewish boys in Hebron if there were any issues. At the same time, the family had invested in property in Kiryat Moshe, and they were living in Kiryat Moshe in Yerushalayim. So my father went to Hebron, and uh, we all know what happened that Shabbos afternoon. At the time, the boys were, uh, as was the custom, uh, were eating in different homes. Essenteg was done in Europe, it was done in Hebron as well. And he was in a home in Hebron. He was, had just turned 17. His bar mitzvah parasha, as a matter of fact, was uh, Nachman, was his bar mitzvah parasha. So that was approximately a month before. He had just turned 17, he was in Hebron, and the riot started. The family retreated to a central room in the house. Um, I don't know if it was a dining room or a parlor, I don't know exactly the purpose of the room, but it was a center of the house, had doors at both ends. The family barricaded themselves in this room, but the doors unfortunately were not solid. They were thin panel doors, solid frames around the sides. Center panels were very, very thin. The Arabs were using their sabers to hock the panels, to hack them into pieces. Uh, the Arab swords being wide, thin blades, like a razor blade, if they hit you with the edge, they could cut your head off. If they hit you with the side too hard, they'd break the blade. As these blades came through, my father had found a pipe wrench and he was busy attempting and succeeding in some cases to break these blades as they came through the door. The, unfortunately, he could only guard one door. The arrows broke through the door behind him and on the back swing, when reaching back to give another swing of his pipe wrench, an Arab came up behind him with a saber and went for his weapon hand and hit the hand, cutting off the pinky and ring finger and shattering the middle finger. They then sliced his hand near the thumb, cutting the tendons to the thumb. He was then under, unable to defend himself in any way. He was stabbed in the back multiple times. His head scalp was lacerated many times. He was left for dead. The British, being the British, um, couldn't do anything. The Arabs were too dangerous. And word got back to Yerushalayim somehow that afternoon. And my grandfather, who this was this was in August of 29, prior to the big crash in October of 29, he was still of means. He lost most of his wealth in the, in, the, in, the, in the bust in Black October. But at the time, he was of means. He was willing to pay for the British to put together a convoy to go. And he was refused. The boys were not picked up until Sunday brought to Shari Tzedek, which is the only hospital of size in Yerushalayim. It's not the Shari Tzedek we all now know in the Givat Ram area. It's now, it was a little tiny place on Rehov Yafo that was totally overwhelmed by the casualties coming in. They triaged their casualties and my father was decided would not survive and they did a perfunctory patching of his wounds and pushed them aside. He survived, he lived. Um, his right hand, however, was never properly repaired. He never really had complete use of his right hand. Um, and he went by, they went back to the States. They still had their home in the States, even though they were living in Palestine. And he recovered there. For many years, I always, I, I asked him, what happened? He wouldn't talk about it. For years, he wouldn't talk about it. 
Everybody we met had another story about what happened to my father's hands. They were shot off in, 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 in the War of Independence and a million and one Bubba Mises, none of them true. Towards the end of his life, he opened up once, but he was a very, very um, introverted, quiet person who did not speak of himself and did not open up at all to people. I don't recall what it was that caused him to open up, but it was only when I was a young adult and he was older um, that I finally got the truth. And he only spoke about it once, briefly, and never again. My father was Nifter in uh, 1982. He was just 70 years old. Heron <laughs> Massacre in 1929 had nothing to do with the 67 occupation. Um, Palestine was ruled by the Ottoman Turks since the, uh, for hundreds of years. I'm not a historian, I can't give you the exact date. 1517. I'm glad. 1517 it is then. Um, I mean, it's historical fact that, that, that the Romans changed, changed the name of Eretz Yisrael. But it was always ruled by somebody else, and for 400 years plus it was ruled by the Turks, and then it was taken over by the British as the mandatory rulers uh, put in by the League of Nations after World War I. Um, the Jews were moving to Palestine. From, uh, it's always a Jewish presence there, but they, they started moving in on, more in Moss in the late 19th century and into the 20th century. And as I understand it, again, I'm not a historian, but I do know quite a bit about the, the area. Um, the indigenous Arabs who lived with the indigenous Jews under somebody else's rule for years were unhappy that so many Jews were moving in, and that's what caused all the turmoil. They didn't want any more Jews to move into what they felt was their land, but really wasn't. It didn't belong to them. It didn't belong to anybody. It was always ruled by a foreign power up until 1947, when the Arabs had their opportunity to get their quote-unquote Palestinian state, they refused. They started a war, they lost. They lost territory. Every time they started a war, they lost, lost territory. And for the first time in history, the loser decided they will, dec they will demand of the victor certain terms. So it's a lot of hoops. There is... Uh there are a number of accounts of how your family, your grandparents, took in other survivors of the Hebron massacre. Those accounts have it under the Arbiter family, not the Harbader family. Can you enlighten us with any more information about that? I don't have any of the details of that. I don't know. I wouldn't attempt to make up stories. I know Rabdov Cohen, a, a Talmud of the Altar of Slabatka, who wrote a book actually the book was written about him called To Rise Above has an account of how your grandparents took him in where, when he had nowhere to go does not surprise me being the kind of people that they were and again they were people of means in a basically impoverished um, territory can't call it country it wasn't a country at the time um, and they took care of their own absolutely but again, details I can't offer on that. What are the lessons in your mind of the Hebron Massacre? Well, if I can be totally politically incorrect, never trust an Arab. These Arab neighbors that rose up and, and murdered, maimed, and, and rioted uh, were supposedly the friends and neighbors of the Jews. Next door neighbors, people from the same neighborhood, people that they said hello to every day. But on that Shabbos morning, none of that meant anything. It kind of shakes your, your um, trust in mankind in general and a particular ethnicity as well. After uh, he recovered from his wounds, he ultimately did go to Poland, did go to the Mir. Um, and he learned, well, unfortunately, this was in 1932, late 1931 into 1932, the Depression was at its height. At this point, my grandfather had lost most of his fortune in the United States, was... Um, being chased by debt collectors, and he uh, left Palestine, leaving his family in the United States. My father, um, at the time a 19-year-old Bacher in near Poland, 
received a telegram that he had to be home for Pesach, that the family needed him, he was the oldest son, he had to come home and help take care of the family. He um, studied, he learned Yamam Valayla, he actually got his smicha Yari Yari Yudin Yudin from Blazing Yudin before he was 20. On the Tanai that he not take a stellar, which he had no intentions of ever doing until he was married. But he had the, the knowledge and the prerequisites, and he was entitled to the smicha in the eyes of the Rosh Hashiva, but he was too young to have a stellar. But the, the stellar wasn't what he was after, he was learning Lishma. He came back, he took his family, and relocated them to Palestine to reunite them with his father, his mother's husband. At that point in 1932, he became, which I proudly, I proudly call him, a Palestinian farmer until 1947 when he became an Israeli farmer. He farmed this um, orange grove, this pardes that they purchased, that 160 dunam I spoke about earlier. And his 10 dunam, by the way, was used to pay off the mortgage on the 160. They also had 80 dunam of kerim, uh, vineyard, right off of what we now know as Kfish 44, the road from Ramla down to Kfish 38, this used to, which used to be the only way into Yerushalayim before 67. In 48, during the war, what we now have is Krish 1, Krish Shachad, that runs from Tel Aviv to Yerushalayim, ran right past the uh, police station, which became a, an elevated fortress at Latrun. The battle at Latrun was, was a famous massacre. The Israelis were desperate to take this um, police station, it was a control the access road to Yerushalayim. They spent three days and nights trying to take this. For three days and nights, they would send boys fresh off the boat. They taught them how to put a, a magazine into a, a rifle and go shoot. They were getting killed. My father, who um, was part of the yeshiv at this time, because of his wounds received at Hebron, could not be put on the front lines. He couldn't handle a weapon adequately, but he could handle the stretcher. He could recover wounded. I know very little about it. My, he didn't tell me this, my mother told me this, that he disappeared for three days and nights at the time of the Latrun counterattack when the Israelis were trying to take the Latrun police station. And he came back a haunted man and never spoke about it. All she knows is that for three days and nights, after each attempted assault, he would crawl out into the fields and bring back the dead and wounded. But because he could not, be given a weapon and asked to, to be, take part in the assault that may have actually saved his life, but he, it further traumatized him. It further um, put him on a road to, to being the kind of person that he actually was and, and, and made him even quieter, more introspective and less willing to talk about his past. When he was in the mirror, he learned uh, under uh, Reblazer Yiddel yeah. And also, uh, Rav Yerucham Lavovitz was still there. Did he ever... He, he spoke very little of his past. He didn't give us a family history. There was, there was none of that. He, uh, uh, we got tidbits through the years. Very often, it was, it, it, it was painful to him to talk about the whole thing, because it was all very traumatic. Remember, he went to the, to the mirror. He was one of us that learned for a number of years. and economic circumstances short-circuited his aspirations and he had to do this rush rush job which is not what he wanted yes okay he knew Yeridei he knew knew, knew Choshen Mishpat he knew Chul he knew what he had to know he could pass his Bechinas we actually have the the, the Smicha letter still but that wasn't he didn't he wasn't going to just get a piece of paper but the, he couldn't do what he wanted there either his life was dictated very much by circumstance. And considering the circumstances he was in, I think he rose to very great levels.